Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're going to take a, a brief moment here to uh, finish off our discussion of taxes. Uh, so this is just a follow up to the last two videos. First one, we focused on understanding uh, the effects of levying the tax on the buyer versus the seller, uh, as well as the incidence of the tax, who faces the burden. And we saw that depended on the relative elasticities of demand and supply. Uh, we also went through a numerical example of finding the quantity traded and the prices paid by buyers and sellers under the tax and identifying the sources of deadweight loss and uh, equity redistributions of the tax. Um, in this video, we are going to focus mainly on the idea of uh, the relationship between the size of the tax and the amount of damage we wind up doing in terms of deadweight loss and the trade-off that we face between trying to raise revenue and trying to do that without causing too much damage in the form of deadweight loss. Okay, so just to refresh your memory, okay, uh, last time we sort of looked at the situation and noted that it didn't matter if we levied the tax on the buyers or the sellers, forcing the tax on the buyer shifted the buyer's demand curve down by the size of the tax, Levying the tax on the sellers shifted the marginal cost or the supply curve upward for the sellers by the same amount. And notice if you compare the left and the right diagrams, the quantity traded is the same under the tax. The tax reduces the quantity traded by 50 units. So the tax in both cases here is blocking 50 units that otherwise would have been uh, mutually beneficially traded. And the price the buyers pay is $11.00. They are $1 worse off relative to equilibrium. They pay a dollar more relative to the equilibrium price of 10. And the sellers are 50 cents worse off. They get 50 cents less than what they would have at the equilibrium price of 10. And we identified the deadway loss here again. The source of that is uh, we have blocked some mutually beneficial trades by creating that wedge between the price the buyer pays and the price the seller is receiving. Okay, so what we're going to think about next is what determines the size of the deadweight loss. And the reason why this is important from a taxation perspective uh, is this is going to give us uh, one particular methodology of thinking about guidelines for which industries we actually want to levy taxes on if we have to raise revenue for, say, goods and services. Okay, and one approach we can think about, one pedagogy, is to let's try to tax markets in the markets where we would do the least amount of damage from levying a tax. Those markets that would have the smallest deadweight loss resulting from the implementation of a tax. Uh, so we're gonna think about uh, when the deadweight loss is big versus small. And hopefully your intuition is already telling you that this may have something to do with the slopes of the demand and supply curves, those relative elasticities. And you would be correct. Okay, so uh, recall again that the price elasticity of demand, this is measuring how much the quantity demanded is changing with respect to a change in price. The elasticity of supply is measuring the price sensitivity of the sellers. What is the percentage change in the quantity supplied with respect to a percentage change in the price? Um, so we're gonna look at a very generic case here. Okay, uh, so here we have a demand curve and we're gonna start by looking at the supply elasticity changing, right? And we're gonna start with a relatively inelastic supply. Remember, inelastic, we're talking about a steeper curve here. So if the price changes, the quantity does not change that much. And when supply is inelastic, what this essentially means is that when things go south for sellers, meaning when the prices go down, which happens to the sellers when the tax is implemented, they receive a lower price. This makes things worse for them but because their supply is inelastic, it's harder for the sellers to get out of the way when that pain comes. They don't leave the market as quickly as they would if their supply curve was flatter and they were more responsive. Because the sellers don't leave the market, this is a little counterintuitive, okay, but the quantity of trade does not drop as much and because of that, we do not lose out on as many mutually beneficial transactions. Okay, that being said, the burden of the tax incidence definitely falls more on the sellers. They are not able to get away from the pain as much as the buyers are who are slightly more elastic in this particular situation. And we covered the nature of the tax incidence in the taxes part one video. 
So if you need to uh, look at that again, please take a moment to do so. Okay, now we're gonna compare this situation to the scenario now where we flatten out the supply curve and we're dealing with a slightly more elastic or slightly more responsive supply curve. Now, before we do this, I want you to just take your fingers and put them up to the screen as if you're pinching that vertical red line that is measuring the size of the tax. The reason why I want you to do that is so you can sort of see how big that is because in the next picture, I'm gonna use exactly the same size tax wedge, the same distance between the supply and the demand curve. So that vertical distance there, the size of the tax, that is gonna be the same in this second diagram where we're now considering a case where the elasticity of supply is higher and it is easier for the firms to leave the market. So that red line that I just drew there, that is the same size as the red line in the previous diagram. So we've kept the size of the tax the same. The only thing we did is we changed the supply elasticity. And because now the sellers are more responsive, when the tax hurts them, they are able to get out of the way faster. They leave the market faster, meaning the quantity traded now falls even more than it would have otherwise, meaning we lose out on even more mutually beneficial trades than we did when that supply curve was steeper. You can think of the really extreme case where the supply curve is perfectly inelastic. If it was totally vertical, then the tax actually doesn't cause any deadweight loss because the quantity supplied doesn't change no matter what the size of the tax is. All right. Uh, now, what about demand? Okay, well, we can run the same experiment. Okay, if demand is very vertical, very inelastic, it's now harder for consumers to get out of the way when the pain comes. Okay, what's the pain for the consumers? Well, the tax pushes up the price the buyers receive. Okay, so tax causes the price to be more expensive for the buyers. If their demand's inelastic, this only drives the buyers away a little bit. Okay, again, meaning the deadweight loss is fairly small because we don't miss out on a lot of mutually beneficial trades. The buyers only respond a little bit. Okay, however, in this case, the buyers do face a higher tax incidence. And again, please reference taxes number one, that first video to see that discussion. Okay, now, if we were to flatten out the demand curve, and again, I'm using exactly the same size tax. Same size tax, flatter demand curve. What's going to happen? Well, now the quantity of trade drops even more because the buyers are a little bit more sensitive. They get out of the way faster when the quote unquote pain comes from that tax. Price goes up, they say, nope, we're gonna leave the market, and the quantity of trade falls below the equilibrium quantity faster. We lose out on more mutually beneficial trades. And as a result, that deadweight loss is larger. Okay, so to just to kind of summarize the effects of changing the size of the tax here. And okay, we know that, uh, you know, over time, policymakers often change taxes. Sometimes they raise them, sometimes they lower them. And what we're going to think about next, okay, now that we saw that the relative elasticities have something to do with the size of the deadweight loss from taxation, is we're going to think about how the deadweight loss uh, and the revenue that we can collect, okay, how those are actually related to the size of the tax specifically. So I'm not going to worry about the slopes of the demand and the supply curve as much anymore. Okay, that was the last analysis we just did was thinking about how the relative elasticities affected the deadweight loss. And the general lesson is that the flatter the curves are, the bigger the deadweight loss is generally going to be. Okay, if the curves are flatter, buyers and sellers are more price responsive, and they will leave faster when the economic climate gets worse for them. Worse for buyers, meaning higher prices. Worse for sellers, meaning lower prices. Okay. Uh, so we're no longer worrying about the slopes of the demand curve and supply curve and thinking about changing elasticities. We've analyzed that. What we want to do next is think specifically about how the size of the tax affects the deadweight loss. So let's suppose we originally put a tax of capital T dollars per unit. Okay, and we can look at now the quantity of trade dropping below equilibrium down to Q1. And there is the initial deadweight loss that we get. Okay, what I want you to think about is what happens to the size of that triangle 
if we were to double the size of the tax. Okay. Maybe take a minute, pause the video if you need to. Okay, but you'll notice that the new deadweight loss okay, is much larger than just twice the old deadweight loss. In fact, if you look at that first yellow triangle, you can actually fit three more of those yellow triangles inside the entire pink triangle. Okay, meaning that pink triangle is not just more than double the original uh, yellow triangle, it is actually four times the size approximately of that original yellow triangle. So point is, we doubled the tax, we actually got a disproportionate response in terms of the amount of damage via the deadweight loss. Okay. Uh, we can take this a little bit more extreme. If we were to instead triple the tax, okay. now if you look at that deadweight loss triangle, it is actually about nine times the size of the original deadweight loss. All right, so the point is, when you increase the tax rate, the tax rate uh, does a disproportionate amount of damage. It does even more damage at the margin. And that increases the larger the size of the tax is. Okay, so the relationship we're kind of observing here is that when the tax increases, the deadweight loss rises even more. We have some sort of geometric or exponential relationship here. Okay, now the lesson to garner from this is that when the tax rates are already low, when they're small, increasing them doesn't cause that much harm. So if I have to raise taxes, it might make sense to do that in markets where the taxes are already relatively low. It wouldn't cause too much more harm in terms of the deadweight loss if that is the perspective we're taking to guide our tax analysis, trying to tax the markets where we would do the least harm in terms of shrinking the economic pot. Okay, however, when tax rates are high, raising those causes much more damage than raising them the same amount when they would be lower. Okay, so we maybe want to avoid from a deadweight loss perspective, from an economic pot perspective, taxing markets where the tax rates are already high and focus on taxing markets where the tax rates are already low if we want to raise revenue without causing too much damage. Next thing we want to think about, okay, so the deadweight loss is the downside from taxing, but from the government's perspective, the revenue is the government's piece of economic pie. That is the benefit of taxation, is the government generates revenue and that revenue can be used to provide goods and services to society. Okay, so we're gonna now think about the relationship between the tax revenue and the size of the tax. And hopefully uh, you would start th by thinking, well, what would happen if the tax is equal to zero? And if there's no tax, then guess what? No tax revenue to the government. So it should be no surprise that when the tax is very small, okay, increasing it does cause the tax revenue to go up. So if I have tax was zero, I'm getting no revenue if I increased it a little bit, and then I'm gonna get some revenue, All right? So notice if we were to increase the tax here from T to 2T, okay, that the gain that I get in these extra pink regions exceeds the loss of what I miss out in that yellow region, okay, meaning, the tax revenue triangle has absolutely gotten larger. Okay, that 2T rectangle, sorry, I said triangle, I meant rectangle. That revenue rectangle under a tax of 2T is definitely larger than the revenue triangle under a tax of only 1T. Okay, so when the taxes are low, increasing it a little bit looks like it pushed revenue up. Notice what happened in the quantity trade. Okay, the tax as we suspected, puts that wedge between the buyer's price and the seller's price and pushes it even further, okay, and further disincentivizes mutually beneficial trades. Trade drops from Q1 to Q2. Now, if the tax is already pretty big and we were to increase it to let's say 3T, notice now that we have driven the quantity of trade so low 
that really no one is buying this good anymore. Few people are, but not many. And because of that, it doesn't matter if we're making a lot of tax revenue per unit. If no one is buying it, then we're not collecting as much revenue as we were before. So again, this new purple, uh, that new purple rectangle there that is absolutely smaller than the pink one. All right, so the idea here is that if we were to increase taxes a little bit when they're low, that causes tax revenue to go up. However, at some point we make the tax too high, that disincentivizes trade, and if everyone stops trading the units, then the tax revenue goes back down to zero. Meaning there is also a nonlinear relationship between the size of the tax and the tax revenue, much in a similar fashion as we saw a nonlinear relationship between the size of the tax and the deadweight loss cost. This nonlinear relationship has a uh, very, I would say it's an infamous name. Uh, it's referred to as the Laffer curve after Arthur Laffer, uh, who is the economist who first popularized this idea. He's a very conservative economist. And he pushed this idea very big under Reagan, um, popularizing the idea of the tax cuts. And Laffer suggested that in America, the taxes were already too high. We were on the right side of this Laffer curve. And if you're on the right side of the Laffer curve, it's actually possible to cut taxes and raise the amount of tax revenue collected because people will trade more units. This is essentially an elasticity argument. Hey, I can cut the taxes and I won't collect as much tax revenue per unit, but people will buy and sell many more units. And if that secondary effect is larger than the fact that I have now a smaller tax per unit, then the total amount of tax revenue collected will actually go up. Hey, this idea has been put forth by conservatives for many, many, many years. And uh, a lot of empirical papers have analyzed this and depending on the source, um, you know, a lot of uh, research papers disagree depending I think on political motivations of potentially who's funding this research. Uh, from my perspective, it looks like a lot of the research suggests statistically that we are not on the right side of that Laffer curve, that we're more on the left implying that in general, if you wanted to increase tax revenue, you should increase the tax rate, not decrease it. Uh, and if we cut taxes, that would cause a reduction in tax revenue. Okay, so to summarize, okay, the tax on good reduces the welfare of both buyers and sellers. Okay, and the welfare loss usually exceeds the revenue the government raises, which is why we have deadweight loss. The government tries to take some of the pie, but in doing that, it shrinks it. Okay, the fall in the total surplus, that is the deadweight loss from the tax, and the source of that deadweight loss in this case was causing the economic, uh, the economic pie to shrink because the tax disincentivized and blocked mutually beneficial trades. Okay, we also saw that the price elasticities of demand were critical not only in determining the relative incidence of a tax on buyers and sellers, but also in determining the size of a deadweight loss in a market when we tax it. Okay, if we increase the size of the tax, this caused the deadweight loss to rise at a disproportional rate. It actually rose in proportion to the square of the size of the tax. Uh, we also saw that an increase in the size of the tax doesn't necessarily cause the revenue to go up. This is a little counterintuitive. You might think, oh, higher tax rate, more tax revenue. But a higher tax rate, remember, disincentivizes trade. If the tax is so high that people stop trading in the market or start going into black market activities, then the government isn't collecting any revenue and the revenue starts to fall despite the fact that the tax rate is higher. Okay, so that is it for our unit on taxes. We're gonna come back, talk about taxes a little bit in the context of tariffs in our international trade discussion, as well as in our analysis of externalities. Until then, um, have a good break. See you next time.